Welcome to the Sri Lankan Understanding, a platform on which we explore the path taken by Sri Lanka and the island in the Indian Ocean. We look at the past, we look at the present, and we look at the potential and opportunity for the future. Our topic of conversation today is looking at Sri Lanka from outside, from Asia and beyond. And we've invited a veteran award-winning journalist who's reported from over 15 countries. He's currently the Asia Regional Correspondent for Nikkei Asia. Mr. Marwan Makanmaka, thank you so much for taking time on one of your visits to Sri Lanka to join us on the Sri Lankan Understanding. Much appreciated, George. If we go back two decades, you were reporting from Mexico. Now, this is Latin America. This is a region that is quite far away from Sri Lanka, but certainly a region that we have a lot of connectivity with. How was Sri Lanka being perceived from that part of the world? Well, uh, personally, as you mentioned, there is a geographic and psychological distance for those of us who are from South Asia. And for us, and for me particularly, Latin America uh, was exotic. It's probably exotic as I suppose an, uh, an American tourist finds when he or she comes to our part of the world. Uh, so it was quite a, a multi-layered form of discovery. Uh, made, I mean, I also had to learn Spanish, so that was quite of a challenge. Uh, and in the process, try to figure out how they understood Sri Lanka because I had to introduce myself. Uh, and often very few people knew exactly where it was. So I had to say in Spanish, Sur de la India, which means uh, uh, south of India and Isla and island. Um, and you know, to respond to your question, generally what you're looking for are impressions people have of Sri Lanka in the same way the impressions we have of other countries. And these impressions are generally formed by what people at that time read uh, in the media, saw on television or on social media, online information and also a bit of a chit chat. Uh, interestingly, uh, Mexico orders a lot of, Mexico is one of Mexico's interesting imports from Sri Lanka is cinnamon, canea. So it was an interesting entry point when I was with friends to talk about the cinnamon connection because they use a lot of cinnamon from uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, in, in the wider context, uh, Sri Lanka technically was a non-story for the larger Mexican people because uh, besides the cinnamon link, uh, there was, you know, it is sad but, uh, you know, it, is not, it was not a big player in the South Asian context. Uh, probably I had to explain what was happening with the war. Uh, and cricket, although they like football. So uh, it was a bit of a challenge to explain and raise awareness about a country that hardly anybody knew. And uh, my assignment there was not anything, had nothing to do with Sri Lanka. I was writing for uh, a news agency called IPS, Enterprise Service, which began in South America and went global to offer a third world perspective, so that's how I ended up in Mexico. You've been working and reporting from several countries around the world. You're currently based in Thailand. When you look at, we'll come to Thailand in a short while in terms of ASEAN, but when you look at other countries around the world, how is Sri Lanka being perceived? How are they looking at the country from outside? You're someone who's Sri Lankan who is out there. So you probably have had a bird's eye view of their opinion, their impressions. What has it been? So, I mean, and, and, and so for instance, uh, as, as a foreign correspondent, uh, before I fly into a country, uh, I do what any other correspondent would do, is you read up on a country, you access what is, in, what is available on the internet, maybe you talk to people who have had connections, who've been to those countries, and then you fly in and pursue not only the story you are assigned to do, but maybe follow other issues to offer some context. And when you draw conclusions or form impressions of a country, they are based on certain what I consider objective conditions plus subjective conditions. The objective conditions would be, for instance, let's look at economics. Uh, they would look at 
you know, um, what kind of economy you have, uh, how open it is to the world, uh, what are people saying about the country. And then you go into a place and you would uh, get a flavor of the biases that come out. Sri Lanka has a problem with its brand. I mean, I will just give you some numbers for you to consider. Uh, three countries that I have been covering in Southeast Asia, which you will discuss later, are uh, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Uh, these countries uh, in the 1980s had huge political problems. For instance, Myanmar was under General Nevin, a dictator who had launched a coup in 62 and remained. Uh, Cambodia, uh, when I arrived in Th Thailand, uh, you know, sorry, Cambodia was also still recovering from the horrors of the Khmer Rouge. And then you have Vietnam also coming out of a war. So Sri Lanka in that sense is also a post-war society. So people will judge you for the difficulties mm. and the challenges you have, but nobody's going to feel sorry for you. Nobody's going to feel sorry for you. And you have to up your game and you have to deliver on an international level and I think Sri Lanka has the potential, and I always draw the analogy of our cricket team, right? I mean, once the Sri Lankan cricket team won the World Cup in 96, it transcended from being maybe also Rands or Minos on the cricket field to a potential challenger. And that is, so there are good signs, but unfortunately, the brand, how it's perceived from outside, uh, suffers a lot. Absolutely. And there are several factors and we'll come to some of those factors in our next segment. When we return on the next segment, we'll be looking at ASEAN, a neighbouring region, and the impact ASEAN has had on Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka's interactions with ASEAN. When we return on the next segment of the Sri Lankan Ambassador. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. We're in conversation with Mr. Mahwan Makanmaka. We're talking about the perception of Sri Lanka from outside as an international journalist, his impressions and what he has seen of this country and how it is being interpreted out there. You talked about perceptions elsewhere in the world, especially Latin America. You're currently based in Thailand and you have been for some time now with Nikkei Asia. When you look at ASEAN's perception of Sri Lanka, We'll come to the historic side of it in a short while, but how is ASEAN looking at our country? What is their image of it? We're an immediate neighbor, not too far away. So, uh, as I mentioned previously, you know, uh, when people form opinions, there are certain benchmarks. Uh, and I mentioned three countries that I covered. Uh, I cover Myanmar, Cambodia, and uh, Vietnam. And during my current visit to Sri Lanka, I'm looking at the economy. An economics professor who I interviewed uh, mentioned the other day that uh, between the period 1980 till now, 40 years, Sri Lanka has attracted only $13 billion in foreign direct investment. Right? Now, we started in 1980. Vietnam had not gone through its opening called the Doi Moi uh, process. It was deeply communist. Uh, Cambodia, as I mentioned, was coming out of the horrors of Khmer Rouge and Myanmar was under General Nevin. Today, Vietnam attracts 15 billion dollars in FDI a year. Right? In the last 10 years, Myanmar has attracted 20 billion dollars after it opened up into uh, tra democratic transition. Right? And uh, Cambodia, likewise, $20 billion. So the question when you, in response to your, uh, your, in response, is to ask, why is it that we are also not attracting this kind of investment? So it's a question that we ourselves have to ask. And as a journalist, when I form opinions on and look for story angles, these objective criteria 
are very important. Uh, for instance, you have the positive like cricket, uh, in other it, which basically tells you that we have a potential of raising our game and you know we can be considered world conquerors in a particular area. But uh, say in economics, uh, ASEAN is competing, ASEAN countries, so there are two tier or there are three tiers of ASEAN countries, right? You have the first tier would be Singapore, which once again learned the Miss Sri Lanka's lessons and has ensured its people have a first world quality of life, right? Just below that, also competing is Malaysia, right? Then you have the second tier countries, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia. And then the third tier uh, would be the CMLV countries, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos and Vietnam. Vietnam is racing ahead and actually they have no time for Sri Lanka because they want to attract foreign investment and uh, they are looking for how their game can be better because we are also competing with them and unfortunately the impressions are well sorry I mean if you are not going to make your place friendly for business friendly for uh, investment uh, nobody's going to come because if you go back to 1967 Sri Lanka had then Ceylon had a golden opportunity of joining ASEAN at its formation before the Bangkok declaration was signed certain countries had made overtures towards Ceylon uh, for whatever reason we did not submit our application and we did not become a member but we are trying to work very hard with the ASEAN regional forum or at least we are in the ASEAN regional forum the depth and degree of uh, activity uh, remains questionable sometimes but what potential is there through the ARF obviously we're not going to get membership in ASEAN anytime soon but at least through the ARF, is there a deeper potential there? So, well, but once again, this comes, this calls into question Sri Lanka's diplomatic strength and its foreign policy strength. And uh, if you look at our history from 48, uh, unfortunately, uh, you have a series of missed opportunities. Uh, and when people look at what you can do, how you can deliver, you know, the, your counterparts on the other side, uh, say the foreign ministries, the trade ministries, the commerce ministries, will also look at what is it that Sri Lanka offers uh, and, uh, and how these positives compare with other countries because they are looking at, say from a business point of view, uh, do you want to park your money in a country like Sri Lanka? Can your capital be protected? One option. Security wise, we enjoy uh, an advantage uh, because of our location. And I think uh, recent governments, Yahapalna government, uh, maybe even Mr. President Mahinda Rajapaksa after the war, current government, they're sort of playing up this concept of uh, strategic strength by uh, location. But just because you you have a good location, it does not mean anything unless there is value added, unless you can say, okay, if you want to strengthen your ties in the Indian Ocean, then you know we are a country for you to consider. But just because you have a piece of land, that is not a selling point. You have to have intellectual capital, you have to have ideas, you have to, you know, because you're competing with other people. And somehow, uh, we seem to have missed these opportunities. I mean, you mentioned 67. Okay, so just look at where we are today. In sh few years after 1948, our foreign reserves, from what I understand, could afford to pay for 17 months of imports. That was a healthy balance of net reserves, right? Today, we can barely afford two months of imports, and that is by borrowings. That's one thing. Between these two, after 67, where somehow we missed the boat, so to speak, on the diplomatic front, there was also in 1985, which people tend to forget, the famous Plaza Accords. This was where the Americans realized that their trade deficit with Japan had expanded because the Japanese economy was booming. 
and they wanted the Japanese to basically structure their currency to lessen the trade deficit which was favorable to the Japanese. So, the Japanese industrialists accepted the American option, but they had to look for places to move all their factories to. One country they looked for is uh, the Philippines, because they thought English speaking country it will work, but Philippines was under the dictatorship of Marcos. It was going through all this turmoil and it was not a friendly investment environment. They looked at Sri Lanka because of the connections with J. R. Jayawad and other Japanese connections. And I am sure if you look at economic history in this country, many big industrialists from Japan probably came around, but then you had the ethnic conflict. So, they are not going to bring in money and capital and invest there. And Thailand benefited from this. It, because it was like an oasis of stability surrounded by Myanmar led by a general who was destroying the country, Laos which was under a communist country which was economically struggling full of poverty, Cambodia coming out of the Khmer Rouge and Vietnam. And Thailand has boomed, I mean today Thailand uh, exports contribute to 60 percent of GDP. I mean we should be envious of that, but you know, yeah. So, talking of ARF sort of long winded responses. You know there are many factors where being involved with ASEAN is good and being involved and, and, and rubbing shoulders with Southeast Asian governments is good, but we must be able to draw some of the positive lessons from them and translate it into policy that can help Sri Lanka grow. And sort of that is where the diplomats, the foreign service maybe the Ministry of Commerce and Trade, we will have to consider. Because when we look at ASEAN, look at the countries in that region, there are constitutional monarchies, there are democracies, there are communist administrations, there are military run administrations. It is a complete diverse melting pot there. But yet ASEAN is probably, after the European Union, one of the most progressive regional groupings. And their countries are benefiting, as you said, Vietnam is quickly moving out of the third tier into the second tier probably. And these countries have seen that and I guess we are going back to that point you mentioned strategy, strategy that is what is most important. We have the location, but you need to use the location effectively. If you go back to Admiral Mahan, he was talking about the importance of the Indian Ocean. The British military was very hesitant to give us independence because they were concerned that they would lose an important link. All these countries realize the importance of our location because they had a strategy how to use it. I guess that is where things went or if well, that is true George and I think uh, uh, correct me if I am wrong and I think maybe your audience can correct me if I am wrong, but you know it is only in the last 10 years that there has been a recognition of Sri Lanka's location as a value because before that the, the, we never thought, we, I mean I grew up, I went to school here, we never talked, we were never taught, we were never talked of this value. And that is because we have, sorry to say, but some of the very uh, worst qualities of an island mentality is mm. that is you are very insular, you are very inward looking and you think that you are the centre of the world and the world owes you a favour, sorry, it does not work that way. Absolutely. When we come back on our next segment, we'll look at the future, steps that can be taken, opportunity, potential, the next segment of the Sri Lanka Magazine. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. We are in conversation with Mr. Madhwan Nakimaka. Before the break, we looked at ASEAN. When we look at Sri Lanka's future, we are now at the beginning of the third decade of the 21st century. We are in our second year now. We are dealing with a pandemic, we are dealing with economic issues. We are not the only ones, countries around the world, especially countries that you are very closely associated with. What does Sri Lanka need to do to sort out the current concerns? I mean, there are more than concerns, there are probably issues that we are facing. For us to surge ahead, for us to become the next Vietnam, for us to make progress, what more does Sri Lanka need to do? Given your experience and your expertise out there in the world, how do you see it? 
it's always a daunting challenge when you ask somebody like me <laughs> to offer an opinion and look into the crystal ball <laughs> because my area of journalism is to sort of hold up the mirror to a society and say this is what's right this is what's wrong and for them then to draw on those facts to form uh, a blueprint for their so i generally am always hesitant when people ask me well what do you think how is things are going to happen but let me accept the challenge uh, just look at south korea yeah. uh, when i was growing up in colombo there was a word in singhala called korea and it never occurred to me what the broader significance was that except it was a reference to a slum you refer to slum areas as korea because it that is that is sort of the urban language uh, mixture that emerged mm. that was prevalent at the time it was a reference to it it came out of what happened in the 1950s when south korea the republic of korea was a basket case coming out of the war and f was rampant with poverty look at south korea today right it is among the g20 it's a powerful economic force and we are exporting labor south korea and you know when i see some of these indicators i think i think so as i said i'm not going to offer you a solution but if I think what are political elite, and it's not just the current dispensation, even the previous rich. I mean, they need to look at themselves in the mirror, look, put the country up in the mirror, and ask. You know, other countries have raced ahead. Vietnam. Uh, it has pride in defeating two powerful Western forces, the French and the Americans. I mean, they lost. Hundreds of thousands of people. It's racing ahead economically. It is a communist-ruled country. It has embraced capitalism, right? So much so that uh, the European Union has signed an FTA with Vietnam. So it's quite happy. I mean, look, all these countries, their geopolitics is real politics. They are quite cynical. They are not based on principle. The European Union has a trade agreement with the Vietnamese and probably turns a blind eye on the, what happens in a one-party state. Right? The Vietnamese are quite happy to do business with the Americans. There are no hang-ups about the mm. American war in Vietnam. You know, they are quite happy. But somehow here, our intelligentsia, the shapers of opinions, they are still stuck with pre-colonial thinking that everything from the West is bad. That's one thing. And secondly, they are stuck with the Cold War mentality that the state as an economic agent is good. Today, there are five communist countries in the world, right? China and Vietnam, very capitalist, right? North Korea, you don't want to be a model of North Korea. Laos, struggling, and Cuba. But if you look at the people who shape opinions in the national media, they are still stuck with these ideas that have been discredited. So until we accept, do some self-reflection and realize, you know, if Vietnam can embrace capitalism and have a communist party, why are we still stuck with the model or the state-driven model of the Soviet Union? The state cannot deliver on the economy it's it's proven this is where i guess we everyone thinks the state must provide jobs the state must provide welfare benefits the state must provide everything that's where we also uh, sri lankans individuals citizens have a responsibility we have a responsibility on election day at a polling booth everybody has a responsibility how many people actually go to vote and question policies programs frameworks that have been drawn up identified no you're looking at a face and you're voting for a face you're voting according to a family tradition you're voting according to some benefits that you have received yeah, personally so, yeah so i think what we have instilled is a kind of patronage dependency culture which actually doesn't play out you know i, I, I know 
uh, I sort of as I, I come in and go out as a journalist and you know if and one of the good things about Sri Lankans is uh, we are very hospitable people and you know you're invited to somebody's house and when I go to somebody's house to interview somebody I sort of draw my impressions on what I see S you know at least over 60 percent of what I see in a person's house is imported items right somebody has to pay for that you need dollars to pay for that and I might meet somebody who will wax eloquently about Marxism who will wax e eloquently about the state as the engine of growth and happily he or she is living in a house with 60 70 percent of imported stuff you know, there's a disconnect so we have to seriously look at ourselves in the mirror and said lifestyle is fine I mean Singapore imports all its stuff mm -hmm. right I'm not saying don't cut imports but you have to find a way of building your industry building your exports uh, and not sending like migrant workers poor you know poor impoverished migrant workers to be your solution that's unfair on the migrant workers absolutely on so the previous segment we've discussed that as well we've talked about that where we're living on them and they're going through terrible conditions they are having a very tough time it's their blood sweat and tears from which we are benefiting yeah so i think there is so uh, you know i i will dodge your question what is the recipe for success i think the recipe for success first has to begin with looking at yourself in the mirror the country has to look at itself in the mirror and ask just why is our brand not attracting foreign direct investment as an objective benchmark. Absolutely. Thank you so very much for taking time to speak to us, to share with us your experience and how you have seen others looking at us. What, and as you said, as a journalist, your perspective is to hold up a mirror to society and say, look at yourself, look at what is happening. And I guess that is one of the clearest uh, measures that we can take for success if we look within. Introspection becomes so very important at this stage where we look at where we are what potential we've had in the past. The history of the country, the history of people of this country is a very important element. Perceptions, how we look ahead, is going to be influenced by where we've come from. And this is where we've got to be very mindful, very clear in where we want to get to. We've got to have clear targets, clear, clear goals. Other countries have them and they're achieving them. It's high time we did too. So thank you once again for joining us on the Sri Lankan Understanding. Join us again next time when we focus on another aspect of this country. We look at the past, we look at where we are right now, and we look at the potential for the future.